Hey guys, it's Nick with Precision here, and today I wanted to talk to you guys about the fundamentals between CO2 and solvent-based extraction. What we want to talk about is the fundamentals of the solvent. We're going to start with CO2. So CO2 typically in the atmosphere, as you guys probably well know, is a gas, right? It's all surrounding us everywhere. But in order to make it a solvent, it needs to go into what's called subcritical or supercritical phase, right? And what happens with a supercritical phase is you're compressing and you're heating that gas in order to make it into a fluid form, right? So typically called supercritical fluid extraction or and if it's at the lower end of that range, subcritical fluid extraction. Now, this technology has been around for years, right? It's been used in coffee, it's been used in vanilla, um, types of artisanal extracts. It's really, really good for decaffeination. They use it in dry cleaning, right? So the technology has been around and about 10 years ago when cannabis really started getting large and people started looking towards cannabis extracts, they said, hey, why don't we try this super critical CO2? So the history of the solvent is that it's been used very widely and people look to uh, repurposing it into the cannabis industry, right? Which um, they started to do maybe, you know, eight, nine years ago um, and it started to really get big about six or seven years ago, right? So all these super critical CO2 applications popped up for cannabis specifically. And when you look at the fundamentals of the solvent, right, the, the, the difference between CO2 and a, uh, a different solvent like hydrocarbon or ethanol is CO2 um, doesn't do a great job at actually extracting the cannabinoids, right? So you've got your, your cannabinoid structure that's contained within your trichome, right? And your trichome is a, um, a mushroom-like shape on the outside of the leaf of the plant, right? And that's what contains all your goodies. That's your, you know, your terpenes, your, your CBD, your THC, your CBN, your CBG. All those things are contained within that mushroom trichome structure, right? So what we want to do with a solvent of any kind is dissolve that structure, right? And isolate those molecules. Now, supercritical CO2 can do this right but it's a very weak solvent so if you think of a solvent and you think of a molecule like uh, like a lock on one side and a key on the other right you want to find the perfect key that goes into the lock and you're kind of sliding it in there you're turning that turning that lock and that 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 door is opening right away right with supercritical CO2 it's kind of uh, similar to trying to jam a screwdriver into the lock right it's going to work Right? but it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of power, a lot of pressure, right? which is why you see these systems that operate between 1500 to 5000 PSI. And because of the nature of the solvent, right, the solvent has to be repeatedly passed over that trichome structure. Right? So we're continuously passing this, this solvent that doesn't have great solubility with cannabinoids and with the trichome structure of the plant over this plant in order to get our goodies out, so to speak, right? So that's why CO2 units have a long cycle time. Typically what you're gonna see is anywhere between on the very low end, two hours, which will diminish your yield and diminish your, um, your returns on your actual processing. And you're also going to see um, longer cycle times the more material that you put in there generally, right? So, these can be manipulated in a number of different factors. Uh, a lot of the CO2 companies have drastically improved uh, upon the old days. You know, the old days it was eight hours per run, right? Um, they've improved that by running things like subcritical, running things like a higher pressure, sometimes up to 5,000 PSI. But it doesn't change the fundamentals of the solvent, right? The solvent is, is, is not the best key for our lock in order to get those cannabinoids and those, uh, those chemicals out of the plant that we're, that we're desiring, right? So that is a, a fundamental overview of why CO2 technologies aren't as applicable. Now, when you look at the equipment side of CO2, right, um, obviously it, it stands to common sense that if you got to have something that's going up to, you know, 1,500, 2,000, 5,000 PSI, right, you can imagine at scale it's simply not economical or feasible in order to have those technologies at scale, right? Because if you think about a gigantic vessel that needs to go to 5,000 PSI, right? Um, think about the amount of engineering that has to go in there, the shell thickness, the, the valve, the safety precautions, right? Um, obviously, when you're working at those types of pressures, um, there's a, a fundamental safety concern. Now, if it's properly engineered equipment, of course the machines operate safely. Um, there's not a, a, a thorough history of, of accidents or things like that, but um, th it takes more dollars, right? Which is why um, dollars to dollars, when you're looking at CO2 equipment, uh, the equipment is actually quite a bit more expensive than solvent-based, right? So what really happens with, with, with all of this total scenario, right, is you start weighing out all these variables against CO2, against solvent-based, 
um, against the equipment, against how, how you're going to scale, what's right for your business, how you're going to apply these technologies to your end products, right? And that's a lot of what we do here at Precision is we, we look at our clients' needs, we, we understand um, what it takes for an end-to-end -end process to integrate and that's part of what differentiates our company is that you know we are end-to-end -end process integrators not just somebody that's going to sell you a piece of equipment and walk away right so um, so what I'd like to do is really is compare that with you know the the fundamentals of solvent based extraction now right and when we talk about solvents we'll talk about the three most popular which would be uh, butane propane and ethanol and there's a lot of other solvents out there that work there's a lot of other solvents that that may come into play in the future um, but we're going to focus around the primary three uh, that are that are used today in the cannabis and hemp industry and we'll talk about how those uh, apply more readily to large scale, especially in CBD production and hemp production. So on the other side of this coin, I want to talk about solvent-based extraction, right? And I want to talk about how it compares with CO2 specifically. So let's go back to our lock and key analogy, right? Our lock and key analogy is we want to find the, the perfect key to go into the lock, right? And on this side is our molecule that we're trying to extract, and on this side is our key. Um, our key is our solvent, right? And we've not found uh, generally a better key uh, in the history of extraction over the last decade or so than butane and propane, right? So butane and propane are uh, non-polar solvents with a light boiling point, right? And what that's going to yield is it's going to, it's going to go in there and it's going to bind to all of your cannabinoids, your terpenes, and the desirable aspects of the plant, right? So if you ever look at artisanal type of products, most of them are made with butane and propane, right? You get that really beautiful light color, that terpene rich smell, right? Which is very, very applicable to artisanal cannabis markets. And it's also very, very applicable to um, moderate scale, right? Different types of manufacturing and, and making different products, right? Now, um, we start to make a little bit of a paradigm shift, right? Because butane and propane, as most of you probably well know, are flammable solvents, right? So, and they also contain a little bit of pressure, which means it costs a little bit more money to engineer the equipment, right? The, the, the shell thicknesses on the equipment have to be a little bit thicker, but not like CO2, right? At CO2, we're talking about 5,000 PSI. Butane and propane, we're talking about anywhere from 50 to 150 PSI. So much, much lower pressures, much safer working environment overall, right? But we wanna keep these vapors contained um, so they're uh, not ignitable, right? You wanna stay in a class one division one room and take all these proper safety precautions. Now, our company's done thousands of installations of hydrocarbon equipment across the entire world at this point, and we can, uh, we can honestly say that uh, I think we're experts in hydrocarbon extraction, and, and we understand that hydrocarbon actually does pull um, the best terpene profile, the best cannabinoid profile out of the cannabis plant. However, at large scale, you can start to see where the actual uh, hurdles come in, so to speak, right? So now, how do I process, you know, 2,000 pounds a day with hydrocarbon uh, on a large scale? It starts to get very costly and very engineering heavy, let's call it, right? Uh, because you have to have all of these different vessels, everything has to be under pressure, everything has to be class one, division one rated, right? So it's not really feasible for, for large scale uh, CBD extraction or large scale hemp extraction. And what we like to usually say is, is you know, if you're an artisanal brand, that means you're processing about a thousand pounds of input biomass per day or less, right? Once you start crossing over that threshold, uh, the cost of engineering the equipment, the cost of the redundancy in the batch equipment, and, and the cost of the hydrocarbon equipment becomes prohibitive, right? And it's why you see a, a large trend towards ethanol. So let's talk about ethanol from a, from a chemical standpoint for a minute, right? So going back to our lock and key method, um, ethanol is also a very good key for our lock, right? But the problem with ethanol is because the polarity of the solvent, it's an extremely polar solvent, right? So uh, the extremely polar solvent, yes, it will bind to our cannabinoids and our terpenes. The problem is, is that it's also going to bind to chlorophylls and to other water soluble or undesirable compounds within the plant. Now, traditionally, what um, everyone has done to combat um, th those water soluble molecules or those chlorophylls is they've chilled their ethanol down. So uh, those of you that are watching this video that are experienced, you may very well know if you run your ethanol at negative 40 or below, um, generally you're, you're able to bypass a lot of the chlorophylls, you're able to bypass a lot of the, uh, a lot of the lipids and the, the phosphide profiles, right? Things that are gonna gum up your process downstream, right? But 
The problem is, is that how do you chill now all this ethanol on a massive scale? So we're in a different, uh, a different era now, so to speak, right? Uh, how do we uh, use ethanol on a scale for CBD that we're doing 10,000 pounds a day? Well, um, it, it comes down to properly engineered equipment, right? It comes down to proper mass balance. It comes down to proper post-processing procedures where you need an end-to-end -end engineered solution, which is what we've done with our KPD series, right? So it's not just pouring ethanol over plant matter, right? There's refinement of the product. There's variabilities in the biomass. There's, there's all sorts of things that are coming down the pipeline, right, that affect your yield. They affect your, your distillate quality. They affect your crystallization, right? All these different variables that you need to have a thorough understanding of, right? So processing at scale, it can be done. You just need to have an understanding and a strong team that understands all these variables and how to combat them. But from a, from a fundamental standpoint of scaled extraction, ethanol is fantastic because you don't have the pressures. There's absolutely zero vapor pressure, which means none of your vessels are under pressure. You're not operating under pressure. It has significantly less flammability um, than, than uh, hydrocarbon, and it's uh, significantly safer than CO2 in the fact that it's not pressurized, right? And People like ethanol because you know, most of us go out to the bar every Friday and Saturday night and drink it, right? We ingest it. Um, it is a, uh, a relatively safe solvent, generally recognized as safe <coughs> from the FDA. So let's, let's talk about an overview <coughs> of, of the common misconceptions that come with solvent-based extraction, right? People tell you, oh, you extract with a solvent or you extract with butane or propane. You're gonna have residual butane or propane in your product. That's absolutely not true. So what happens is once the product is extracted, there may be trace amounts of butane and propane, but it goes through a heating and purging process, right? Typically that's done either in vacuum drying ovens or in decarboxylation or in, in distillation, right? That's gonna remove that solvent and there'll be zero parts per millionth of any sort of residual solvent. Right. Um, same thing with ethanol. Ethanol is a little bit harder to take off because it has a higher boiling point. Right. It's not as volatile. It doesn't vaporize as easy. Um, but the same thing. Right. It's going to be pulled off in decarboxylation or in uh, in distillation. Um, and it's ironic because a lot of the people that that preach. Um, anti-solvent extraction, right? They're in the CBD market and they realize once they get to uh, crystallization that they're forced to use pentane, which pentane is a, a group D hydrocarbon and you know needs to be purged, needs to be dealt with in a class one division one room, needs to have all these parameters. So again, understanding your process and, and, and working with really, I can say, educated people, um, not believing a lot of the, the marketing hype that's out there because everybody wants to sell you equipment, but in the end of the day, do they know how to integrate your process end to end? Do they really understand the science of what's happening behind the process? And have they done it before? Do they have a long operational history? So these are things that I would definitely, you know, ask the people that you're that you're potentially doing business with. A lot of what we do here with our R&D team is that we test these processes, we test new parameters, we're working on ways to optimize the extraction process. Uh, you know, our company, while we're a, an equipment manufacturer, we're a process integrator, but we always focus as an innovative technology company, right? So we're always looking at disruptive disruptive technologies what's going to change in the future market trends, um, what's going to happen to these markets, uh, how, how do we get to scale for lower cost, and, and we look at all these variables, and, and that all starts on the bench, right, which you guys can see the lab behind me, you know, uh, we work with our team very closely, and we're always working to find a more efficient, more effective uh, process, right, uh, while still being able to integrate the existing processes and, and making them work really well, right. So um, I thank you guys for listening today. You know, you can uh, shoot some comments below or shoot us an email, give us a call if you have questions. We're happy to, to help and uh, we've got a large staff that can, that can help you guys out and thanks for watching the video. Appreciate it.